dun 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 Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to the pilot episode, season one, episode one of the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog. Welcome. We are coming to you live from the studio, aka my basement, and I am so happy and enthused to be here with you all. Thank you for joining us on this adventure. Let me introduce myself. I am your host, Blair Parks, and I am joined by the eye candy of the show, but also the intelligence. He is my 3PO to my R2-D2. He is my Quentin to my Tarantino. The one, the only, the Adonis of a man, Charlie Oswald. Hello, Charlie, everybody. Charlie, my friend, how are you today? I'm doing well, Blair. How are you? Oh, I am I am so pumped up. My blood's flowing. It's circulating. I'm just I'm fired up. I'm giddy. It's college, college football. College football is nigh, everyone. She is closing in very, very quickly, and we are so pumped up. Absolutely. As you saw from the description, the point of this vlog is we are going to touch down on every aspect of the college football landscape from coast to coast, north to south, but with a special emphasis on the black and gold teams that we root for, the Iowa Hawkeyes and Missouri Tigers. So we will definitely be looking more in depth too at the Big Ten and the SEC, and we will be having this ongoing debate of which conference does it really mean more to? We know which it is. <laughs> Time will tell. Time will tell. Um, to give you the overview of the show, before we introduce or describe what college football really means to us specifically and why it's so sacred, is right now we're, we are videoing this on the, what, the 13th of August? What we are going to be doing from here out, we will be having a weekly vlog. Probably will be coming out Wednesdays, maybe Thursdays. Definitely make sure to smash those subscribe buttons. You can get notifications when the most up-to-date has been downloaded on YouTube. So we will be having one a week until the official uh, first uh, week of kickoff, which is the Labor Day holiday weekend. Even though there is a week zero this year, up until that week, we will have one show a week. And then during the season, our plan is to have twice weekly. One will be a review of what happened over the weekend. And then later that same week will be a preview of the games to come up on that weekend. Absolutely. All right. So at this time... <clears throat> I have already, a lot, let me introduce myself further. Or Charlie, would you like to go first? What does college football mean to you? I, this is not just my show. I should you have know, some manners. So I college, should have some manners. That's all right, brother. Charlie, tell the good folks at home. Some people might say to us, this is just a game. Why are you fanatics? Why are you fans? What does it mean to you? Tell the good people at home, what does college football mean to you? College football to me is, you know, being married with two kids, um, it's my weekly escape. You know, work sucks, you're hectic, you're busy, you're going. When Saturdays come, you can turn on football, you can zone out and enjoy your day, and nothing can change that. Yep, absolutely. I mean, I the sentiment is also there. I am also a family man with two children. It is a chance for us to escape the daily grind. And to tell you, we aren't professionals. We aren't looking to get filthy Johnny Manziel rich doing this. We are just two guys who want to share our passion with you and anybody who basically will listen. And since you are with us, we highly appreciate you listening as we share this passion with you. And also a chance for my boys to prove that they're superior over his boys, mm. M-I-Z. Well, we will see. I mean, if memory serves, which we will talk about here in a little here we bit, go. there was supposed to be a bowl matchup. Here we go. But here I'm not go. saying who. I'm not saying someone 
was waving the white flag, mind you. I'm not saying that, but maybe a little bit of sabotage. We'll get to that in a little bit. We didn't want to embarrass you. <laughs> anyway, now what college football means to me, and sorry if you're at home wondering, no, this is not my real hair. This is a homage to my late father, who was Iowa Hawkeye fan number one. And today I'm sporting Iowa number six, who is the legendary Tim Dwight, hands down my favorite Iowa football player of all time during my lifetime. And also, too, in the very beginning, I my apologies to not pointing this out before, I did give a little intro. My tune was the glory days and the beginning of MTV when they actually played music videos. Music videos. Imagine that. It was their 40th anniversary earlier this month on August 1st, so kudos to you, MTV, you made it. And that's something that you're also going to see a lot with our show. We are all about pop culture. We love music. We love movies. We're both basically the same age group, age, same age bracket. So we will be making a lot of references to those pop culture shows, tunes, events that have shaped our lives. Yes. So college football to me is not just an escape, and Charlie is right. It is a chance to put everything aside for me on a weekly basis that provides stress. You have stress from jobs, stress from kids, this and that. It's just a moment to get away and enjoy yourself for two and a half, three hours, well, four hours if you're watching the Fox televised game. But also, it runs so deep in my blood. Once again, my father introduced me to Iowa Hawkeye football. He did leave us a few years back, but he is always with me. This was his hat, so this is an absolute honor. I feel like he is with me right now during our show. So college football, but more specifically Iowa football, is a family affair to me. And that's why it means so much. And we love the pageantry. We love the celebration that it provides, the camaraderie, tradition. It is absolutely no blasphemy intended, but it is sacred yes. to guys like me, guys like us. It is a yeah. sacred passing in this nation. And quite frankly, I think it's the greatest sports spectacle we have in this nation. Oh, hands down. Hands down. College football is something that I'm going to... You know, I get to share with my kids, my grandkids, and so forth. That it is something that I want my son to share, hopefully with his sons. Or if he has girls, that's fine too. I'm gonna share with my daughter. You know, this is something that is important to me. Um, something I've always had a passion and love for. It's just college football is where it's at. NFL is okay. College football is ten times better. Yes, we are not going to knock our NFL brethren. No. Obviously, all those players had to start someplace else. That's right. And that was at the college ranks. And quite honestly, I I don't know about some other people out there, but I can't sacrifice both a Saturday and a Sunday in no, the fall. No, no. My preference is and always will be Saturdays for college football. If I had to sacrifice both days, I would be divorced. Yeah. Um, my wife is all about, let's go to the apple orchard, let's go to the pumpkin patch, let's do some stuff. So Saturday's my day, Sunday's family day. Yep, absolutely. And that is a, a safe and healthy balance. You have to have that. Yes. But as our children get older, we can share this passion with them. And that is the beauty of college football. It has marked the time. Um, next thing I'd like to move into is what we aren't going to do on this show. This show, now we are going to say things at times that might upset you. We do not intend to offend anyone. That is not our, that's not what we are looking to do by any means. You obviously, you might disagree with some things we yes. say, and that is totally fine. This is a open forum for public question, concern, for discussion, and we want that once again. But, but just be, when you are leaving us comments on the YouTube page, Please feel free, just be an adult. Be yes. respectful. Do not cross the line. We are all adults here. I don't need to say what that line is. It is something that we all should know. So please be respectful. Let us know how we're doing. 
And can't we all just get along, like Rodney King once said, peace and love, everyone. The other things that we are not going to do is we are not going to discuss politics. No. We will do everything in our power not to bring up the political landscape in this nation. But we are realists, and we do know that that sphere of politics, unfortunately, has crossed into the sphere of athletics at all levels. So sometimes it might be involved in one of our topics and segments, but we are not gonna expand on politics. So if you're looking for a political vlog, you're at the wrong place, move on, and good luck to you. My politics is who's gonna win on Saturday? Who's, who's gonna set themselves up to fail? Who's gonna set them, who's gonna be the underdog that punches the, the Probably the team right in the mouth, and what coach the seat is going to get a little bit hotter. Absolutely. Whose butts are going to be puckering a little bit more each week on that hot seat. Yes. And do not be afraid. Charlie and I, we have been friends for the better part of 12, 13 years now. Yes. Even when we agree, we disagree. I am not here to win arguments, neither is he. Not even arguments, I'd say debates. Debates. These it's are friendly debates. debates. These are topics. It's college football. We're passionate about our teams. We're passionate about the sport, and... You know, we can get along. Yes, absolutely. We will get along. And this is going to be... I'm so excited to do this. Ab yes. Before we came on, we've been discussing this for at least two, if not three years. And here we are finally. And we are newbies at this. Like I said, we are not pros. We will only get better. We might put our foot in our mouths every now and then. Please just bear with us. Thank you. All right. So I think what we will do next is let's go into our first topic up today is the season recap and review from the 2020 season and boy oh boy we all know what is currently going on in this nation and the world COVID-19 which we are still in the grasp of I think we're still in the woods but we see the clearing people we are getting there but now we are kind of come across Maleficent's thorns to yes. where we can navigate around this. Everyone has been affected. So sports, when COVID-19 broke out, the world turned upside down. A little, little Hamilton reference there for you. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore, and a Scotsman get dropped off in the forgotten spot in the Caribbean. I could go on and on. Yeah, know that. Yes, I could. Yes. Word got out. They said, this kid's insane, man. Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education. Don't forget from whence you came. And the world's gonna know your name. What's your name, man? Uh, I'm not a big theater person. My wife has watched that hundreds of times. I've never seen it. His name is Alexander Hamilton. Okay. And there's a million things he hasn't done. But just you wait. Thank you. See, these are things that we will do every now and then. Kind of off script that comes to our heads and just let it fly. We're going to have fun with this. And football is life, for, to quote the great Danny Rojas from Ted Lasso. Have you checked that out yet? No, I have not. I know we talked about it, and uh, I haven't had a chance to yet. The great Danny, oh, Ted Lasso is a must-watch for all of you at home. Jason Sudeikis, classic entertainment with Danny Rojas. Football is life! So let's go into the recap and review from last season. COVID, there were so many uncertainties. Um, and also, I think at this time, we can both express, so I will for myself and Charlie, that for all of those who have suffered through this pandemic, whether it's uh, been infected, struggled and recovered, or family members who have passed away, our condolences, our thoughts are with you. Um, but the season recap, when it came down to it, we didn't even know if we were gonna have football. No. Wasn't that something yes. where all of a sudden overnight, when Rudy Gobert, I believe, was the center for the Utah Jazz, tested positive, everything was on hold. From that moment on, athletics, social life, anything and everything, completely at a standstill. 
So there was a time when the Big Ten, my conference of choice, the conference of choice, said we aren't even going to play football. But the SEC hung in there, and kudos to them. They did their due diligence. They waited. They investigated, and they made the decision, and we got to the finish line. Yes. And eventually the Big Ten did play. So we did throw the towel back in, along with the Pac-12, who also said they weren't going to play, and the Mountain West, and I believe the MAC did that too. Mm -hmm. The MAC also. Every Division I major conference ended up playing some football. So well done. And well done to Notre Dame. Ooh, ooh, shot Go fire. Into the ACC. Shot fire. Not the Big Ten, oh. the ACC. Oh. Well, that's maybe a debate we can talk about some other time. Is yeah. Notre Dame, should they join a conference? And if they do, would the ACC be best for them? Or, I mean, they're in the Big Ten footprint. Would the Big Ten love to have them? Absolutely. It's money generator. So, you Notre Dame fans out there watching, please let us know what your take is. Because Notre Dame is. A quintessential program. It is historic, the brand. But let's just wait to find out what happens with old Notre Dame, with the Golden Domers. But eventually, when the smoke cleared and we got to the playoffs, the Final Four was, well, pretty vanilla. It has gotten a little watered down to where the rich got rich and the richest got even richer. Yes. The Final Four. We had, big surprise, Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, Notre Dame. And the matchups in the semifinals, you had Alabama and Notre Dame. Yeah. Oof. Oof. And then you had Clemson and Ohio State. Eventually, the winners would be Alabama and Ohio State met in the national title game. And Alabama would come on top. So Alabama gets another chip, another ring for Nick Saban. SEC. Lord Saban, I should say, right? He yeah. is. He's the I best. know he's part of the SEC, but, you know, I I, I just, you know, it's, it's bitter. As, as a Mizzou fan, knowing that we're, you know, a lower team in that division, competing against him, it's bitter. But kudos to him, kudos to that program. Yeah, they got it done, and they continue to get it done until someone knocks them off their stoop and someone else is on the pedestal there. We can expect them to be back. Time right? time again, yeah. Now, really quick, kind of something. Let's just talk about who looked better and who looked worse. Let's go back to the semifinal games because I watched them. I think, did we watch those together? Yes. Yes, we did. We didn't watch the national title game together. We did watch the national semifinals, yes. though. That Alabama... Looked really good. Ohio State looked really good. But when it came down to defeat, did Alabama look better winning against Notre Dame or Ohio State against Clemson? What do you think? I think Ohio State against Clemson. I have to agree. Why, why would you think that? What's your, what's your uh, decision on that? What, you know, for to me, if you watch the games, both games, Alabama – it just looked like they were just going through the motions. Routine, a routine scrimmage, just getting it done there. Executing the game plan. Defense was tight, offense. Ohio State and Clemson was a better game, is more entertaining. Um, I, I like hard hitting. I like, you know, kind of the back and forth a little bit. I, I enjoy that more from a, as a football, you know, where you got to see coaches that, you know, you come out on a, you know, to, the, to the game with the game plan, and if you don't have to change it, is it really challenging? I want to see a coach make his adjustments. I want to see a coordinator make an adjustment, you know, or a DC, you know, how are they going to change their defense to stop, stop somebody? It's a chess match that, to me, is that is, to me, what college football is about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I agree with you. Alabama did what Alabama does against Notre Dame, executed, took it to Notre Dame, definitely had a game plan to try to c control the game a little bit, primarily ball control, let's bruise them, let's run it down. Because Notre Dame didn't really have a lot of what you would call standouts, uh, uh, wide receivers right. or tight ends like Notre Dame usually does. But no, Notre Dame was just a little bit outmatched and outnumbered and outgunned. Well, I think it's also, if you look Another at Hamilton reference, by the, way. the overall talent level, mm -hmm. 
is, you know, there was a greater divide between those two as opposed to Ohio State and Clemson. Yep, absolutely. If you look at the, if you look at the recruiting classes, you know, the, the few years leading up to it, it was definitely a significantly lopsided. Yep, absolutely. And plus, too, I've got to admit, I mean, I would never talk bad about Coach Dabo Sweeney. And do I know him? Do we talk on the dailies in my favorite five? No. But giving Ohio State that kind of bulletin board material saying, I believe it was a week and a half before that matchup, that he ranked Ohio State as the 11th or 12th best team in the nation, somewhere around that. Not necessarily because they were talented. I mean, he did... He didn't say that. He said based on the amount of games they've played, which was much less than what Clemson had played, I don't see even having them in the top 10 and then seeing how Ohio State and Ryan Day and those boys absolutely ran them off the field. I got to admit, I think they looked much better in winning too. There's no doubt about it. I think so. But Alabama, national title game, just too much. And also, something else that happened, I forgot to mention, my apologies, is finally, I can't remember the last time this happened, probably not as long as we like to think, but whenever anymore we think about the Heisman Trophy and the hardware that comes with that, it's a quarterback won award. I can't remember the last time it's it been, went. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's been a while. It's been a very long time. That's actually a really good trivia question. If somebody wants to comment and let us know, when's the last player who won the trophy that was not a QB, let us know. I think I actually might know. Woodson from Michigan? He might be the last one that I can remember who won the Heisman Trophy Without who wasn't a QB. Year for year, I mean, yeah. Charles Maybe. Woodson, right? I think that's the last one that I can remember. No, there's been some. There's got to be more since. But please let us know. But Devonta Smith, the wide receiver, kind of the all-purpose player for Alabama, got it done, took home the hardware. Good for him. Congratulations. I think he is going to be a absolute stud in the NFL if given the right system to play in and players around him. So that was refreshing. Yes. Anymore, the playoffs, we're getting down to where it's always, it seems to be the, the same three or four teams. But to see a wide receiver when the Heisman was very refreshing, and it was, absolutely. Yes. So congratulations. This year coming up, man, but also last year, let's just take a little bit of time, and before we talk about specifically Missouri's year that was, Iowa's year that was, what are some of your lasting impressions of last year? What were some of your favorite moments from things that you Watch maybe. How about we'll start with non-Mizzou related. What are some of your, what some of your favorite standout moments from last well, year? Well, we talked about this, you know, off and on since it's happened. But like BYU on a roll last year, and then Coastal Carolina coming in and saying no. BY who you BYU. And I admit, I I always seem to root for the Cougars. I just do. It's so hard for them to compete. But they were rolling undefeated, and they end up going to Coastal Carolina, the Chanticleers, and an epic game that came down to it. It fit the bill, and what a great experience for the so-called non-Power 5 to have that sort of a showcase. Oh, absolutely. Game day was there. I believe it was supposed to be Liberty and Coastal Carolina. Yes. Liberty had COVID issues. And BYU looking to get that signature win because they were uh, maybe even ranked in the top 10. Very yeah. highly ranked. I will say Coastal at the time was like 10 or 11. Yes, so this is a top 15 at the worst matchup to where each team wanted, we need to get a signature building win if we're going to try to make the New Year's Six, if right. not the playoffs. And this was put together within three or four days. I yes. remember hearing the stories. It, made it was like a Monday or a Tuesday, yes. and they said, because BYU was like, we want to play, we'll anybody, play anybody. Anybody, anywhere. BYU told their truck drivers, load up the trucks, get the equipment, and just start heading eastbound. And basically, by the time we get to, I think, Nebraska, we'll let you know where to go or to come back. That's how quickly that came together. And what an epic game it was. It was Hands down, the to me, the best game last year to watch. I mean, I have so many good memories 
of big Iowa victories like Charlie does for Missouri, but just to see that caliber of football That's for that game. level, it was that just was back and game. forth. Oh, you can't tell me they can't do that moving forward. Oh, yeah. they can't I, do that. You know, if I was a you know a fan of one of those programs as a diehard, I would be like, I want that on my schedule every year, back and forth. Make yeah. that a new rivalry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or just in general. I mean, let's say if Mizzou's having a great year, let's say they're undefeated, and you say, you know what, we purposely have left a le week 11 or 12, maybe we have an open spot. You can't tell me to say to climb the poles, let's call somebody and make it happen. Let's get, to, let's get together and put together a high-class, high-stakes game. There's no reason why that can happen all the time. I don't see why it can't. I don't see why it can't. But, be, but if you did F across the board, everybody would be scrounged at the last minute to try to, to find put something together. And if you couldn't, then you got another week in there. That's just a wasted game. You could be left out, too. Yes. Man, I feel like, whoo, <laughs> whoo, what is that? Uh, the puppet Peanut? Uh, what, what's uh, uh, Jeff Dunham, right? Peanut and Jose uh, Jalapeno and Ahmed. Doesn't Peanut go, hey, lady? This hair, I tell you, this is great. <laughs> what do you think? Is this a good look for me? It is. Absolutely. It, it, it Absolutely. And once again, this, this face, this was not made for the camera, people. I have a face classically made for radio. That's why I have the eye candy right here with me to make this look good. Yeah, you compliment me well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's truthful. It's okay. I've made peace with that. It's okay. Time has been better to you. You are the no, sexy, my no. friend. No, no, no. You, you are the no, sexy, you my are the sexy. <laughs> this is true. Little SNL action there. Look into it. Good uh, skits. Chris Kattan as the, how do you say? Ah, oh, yes. The show with Antonio Banderas. Look into it. Good stuff. I do feel like peanut. Hey, woo! Anyway, um, also, too, another for me, I think that game was epic enough, but I remember it was either week two or week three, and Army was on CBS. Army had the national game. Yeah, yeah. And I loved that last year. That was one thing that the first couple weeks of the college football season, the little guy was on full display, and I loved seeing that. Yeah. And there we are. You know, where they're at West Point, and there's no crowd, but all that's in the stadium is all of the recruits, the cadets are there, and their camo, their fatigues, their camo masks, and they're spread out across the entire stadium. I think it said 2,000 men, and just, they play jump around by House of Pain, and to see that happen pre-kickoff was an instant classic it's those are the things that made last season so great and that's why and you don't way. see that in nfl and no. that's why college football is head and shoulders above the nfl and we always talk about see, going to games where there's big rivalries involved yeah. at some point we've got to get out to annapolis or philadelphia west point to watch army navy we have got to do that at Absolutely. some point Absolutely. those are our boys thank you for all you do it's hard not to root for those uh, academy schools for everything they do for us, they protect us. Those are our boys, people. If you can't get behind Army, Navy, Air Force, then I don't know what to say. I just don't. Those are our boys. Um, but let's move on now, more specifically. Let's move on to how it went with our specific teams of choice. So, being the gentleman that I am, Charlie, why don't you tell us kind of what Last year defined, or what were some lasting impressions? Good, bad, ugly. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. So for, of Mizzou football. You know, for, so for, to me, with a new coach, new system, you never know what to expect. You know, uh, you lost people to the draft, you know, aging out, graduating and stuff. So not knowing a lot about Drinkwitz. Um, I love the guy now. I think he's got high energy. He's, he's doing it right. Um, up until that point, you know, one year head coaching at App State, it's like, um, what are we getting? You know, uh, Barry Odom, defensive-minded guy, maybe not quite the head coach that we thought he was going to be. 
whatever. But he's still, you know, he's a true son. You know, mm -hmm. I, I remember watching Barry, and his, you know, going to stands and watching him play linebacker back in the day. And, you know, he's a great guy, mm -hmm. stand-up guy. Um, then you had a new system in place. So then you see the offense starting to click. But the one thing that kind of scared me was when I watched the Tennessee game and Tennessee controlled the line of scrimmage and just did whatever they wanted. And I'm thinking, oh, man, what are we getting ourselves into? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're, I'm just kind of like going through the motions like, ah, I'm just really nervous. And then, you know, here comes LSU and, you know, we knock off the national champion. Yep, I'll say the defending national and champion. And I was like, woo. You know, and that was a great game. That was one of those, yep. at the end, you know, we had, you know, Nick Bolton come in and knock that pass away to win the game. I mean, you can't beat that. That's that's right down to the wire, you know. It's like back in the day, um, I remember watching the Rams play the Titans. I'm a Mizzou fan. Mm -hmm. Who won that game? Mike Jones. Mm -hmm. Where do you play linebacker? M-I-Z? Z-O-U. That's it, you know. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, and then watching the, the battle that they did and not letting themselves get down against Arkansas, you know, and come back and win in that, and then just – the grit that the guys have and coming around, then of course, you know, now Basilock, you know, was, was the co um, freshman of the year in the SEC. So that's stuff to build on. Mm -hmm. And he's recruiting well. So, you know, I'm excited for this season because I saw good things last year after being scared. Yes, did they get manhandled a few times? Absolutely. It's going to happen. Yep. That's, that's, that's college football, you know? I remember watching App State knock off Michigan. Yep. Back in the day. It's going to happen. It happens across the board. That is what makes... Sorry for that reminder there, Michigan fans. Yes. But... That's okay. Blue? <sighs> yeah, we... Not big, Ann Arbor's yeah, a, not a good person. We... we re <laughs> she is maybe a woman of ill repute, we'll put yes, it that way. Yes, But we respect all fan bases, all teams, but there are just some that we have a little less love for than others. That's all. You can sit there if you're... Go blue through and through. Good. Excellent story program. If you want to call me a dirty SOB or Charlie, that's fine. That's totally your prerogative. But we still respect because that's, once again, all things college football, we back, and that's what we are about. Yes. But yes. To echo some things you said, and I hate to cut you off, mm -hmm. and if you want to do more, but absolutely. I will say this Coach Drink, very nice. I like you. I have to admit, this guy is making such a big impression on me. He might be the the best sound man, sound bite oh, guy in the SEC. Absolutely. The stuff he does when he calls in, you know, he's been on different shows and he's like that that manly player, you know, he's young, he's got so much energy in life and it's hard not to like him. Mm -hmm. So I know why the the players are buying into him and you know, the recruiting trail with, you know, people forget that Mizzou had stuff in place because of the scandal with the tutor. So he got limited things like the recruiting and scholarships, and for him to do what he's doing, I'm gonna, you know, it's going to be exciting to see what he does in a couple more years. It's impressive. I mean, I've got to say, when people say, oh, that they're, that, that's just good recruiting for Missouri, that's good recruiting in general. He is absolutely killing it on the recruiting trail. Keep it up. I mean, seriously, I, he is really growing on me. I mean, I, I don't want to say I was apprehensive about the hire because coming from Appy State – they're a solid program. They're going to compete every year. They're going to get into a bowl yeah. game in the Sun Belt Conference. Great conference, by the way. Keep doing what you're doing. But he is absolutely blowing me away. I mean, you know, and, and he is. You look back at some of the stuff he did when he was offensive coordinator at NC State. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, So you know he's got an offensive mind. Yep. And I think that he's just going to grow. And he's not going to be like, there's a guy I love and say, Gus Malzahn. Oh, to yeah. me, he is one of the most offensive, great minds, but he hasn't changed with time. Nope. And I think that was his downfall at Auburn. But I think Drink can adapt as time. So as defenses make adjustments, he's smart enough that he can make adjustments and stay that step ahead. Mm -hmm. So as we start getting the talent that we, we can pull now with, with a great coach, you know, that gap with, with Florida and Georgia, and then you have the rest of the East – that's going to close off now, mm -hmm. you know, because now you got, you know, Tennessee is going to get better. Kentucky's improving all the time now. And then, you know, South Carolina's making some changes. Let's see what they can do. Mm -hmm. And the only one they got left is Vandy. And, you know, I feel bad for them, but, you know, they they win some games they shouldn't. Yep. So, you know, the that Georgia-Florida and then everybody else, that's going to stop. Yep. And I think, you know, in another year or two, you might see Mizzou. They might not be, you know, they might not get the number one spot out of the East, but – 
you know, if they can get number two consistently, yep, eight, nine wins a season, I'll take it all day. Nothing wrong with number two. No. It's healthy. Anyway, so <laughs> you guys were five and five. Yes. And to me, from, and we've discussed this before, but obviously this is brand spanking new to our family, our extended family. Five and five on paper, some people would say, okay, well, you were right. 500. Yeah. But to me, first year coach, like you said, well, no you, spring ball, yes, no COVID, summer ball, yes, no yes. anything, brand new coaching staff, new system to go five and five. I can't, I can't ponder why that's not a victory, especially an all SEC schedule. How can that not be a success? Well, you know, and I had some people, you know, they'll come up to me and they're like, hey, Charlie, you know, what, you know, you guys were just average. You know, they said Larry Roundtree carried the team on his shoulders offensively. He's a beast. Yeah. Was, he, was he a probably a top three, top five running back in SEC? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you can have a Ferrari, but if you don't know how to drive a stick, you ain't going anywhere. Yep. So you got to know how to how to use him. Tyler Beatty out of the backfield. I mean, we made the changes that we need, and we started controlling that line of scrimmage, and you started seeing the wind start to mm -hmm. come into play. And I, is that your favorite moment, the win against LSU? You know, I think so, because now, now I, I get it. LSU at the time was kind of in a, a, a chaos. There's a lot going on. Yeah. But to say that you, as, as a first-year head coach, you got a historic win. That is a historic Absolutely. win for the program. Absolutely. You beat the defending national champions. I don't care if they were 0-20, but they're still the defending national champions. Yep. You can say, hey, we just beat, you know, look what we just did. And they are a power program. Who doesn't want to go play for LSU? Who doesn't want to play in Baton Rouge in, in the Valley? Who doesn't want to do that? And yes, they had a ton of of uh, turnover for our or their, for graduation and a lot to the draft. But still, to defeat the defending national champions, LSU, the way they did, it was a good game. It wasn't it was, like it, it was, was an absolute <clears throat> one-sided affair. Missouri was the better team that day to where that is absolutely potentially a program-changing win. And it is. That was a great victory, a great moment for Mizzou last year. No doubt about it. Right. And Connor Basilak, I know you're excited. I'm very excited. This year, we definitely expect, and we'll talk more about this. <clears throat> Next week, we're going to go more in depth with the season previews for Mizzou and Iowa. But there's definitely good things to, to like this season. But I think maybe one more year. But next year, I think, is the year, and they get Georgia at home next year. Oh, that's going to be... So next year is the year to where they're going to be maybe potentially ready to challenge for that division. I hope so. I would love to see, you know, obviously as a diehard Mizzou fan, you know, see them compete mm -hmm. where if, you know, if Georgia stops their their dominance and you start seeing Florida come back around and mm -hmm. if you can see that talk to say hey Mizzou whoever wins Mizzou and, and, and Florida is going to be the mm -hmm. SEC East champion or over here you know if it Mizzou and Georgia or maybe even Tennessee or Kentucky comes up you mm -hmm. just never know I mean that is what is what is so good about college football yep. because yeah you have your top tier programs but eventually things change yep. you know it cycles you know mm -hmm. what's good here is going to drop off eventually yep. but you have your historic programs Oklahoma. Yep. Oklahoma. You know, to me, they're overrated all the time. Now they're coming to SEC. Come on in. We'll play you. It doesn't matter. But, you know, if you look at them in the last 25, 30 years, you know, they're always ranked high. You know, I remember when Stoops was there right before he left, you know, they'd start the season, preseason rankings in the top 10, three games into the season. They're, they're 18, 19. They even drop down to the 20s or even drop out of the top 25. Mm -hmm. But then they can pick right back up. So, you know, I don't want Mizzou to be an overrated team. I want them to be a solid team that they're going to win some, they're going to lose some. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're lose games they shouldn't because of turnovers, mistakes, something. But there's also going to be those those big wins. Like, you know, um, I remember you go back three four years ago, we go down to Florida, and I think we had maybe when Matty Mock was there, like this is the second to last year, we had like less than 200 yards of offense and won mm -hmm. huge yep. because our defense just carried us. Yep. Those games are amazing. Yep. And then the amazing game was Arkansas. I got to admit, because I was, was down it. here on the couch with the projector screen, with my wife, with Patty. We're watching the game. Arkansas just scored. And then they had that batted two-point conversion. Mm -hmm. But with like a minute 30, minute 40 to go, the way that was going, I told my wife, I said, there's nothing to worry about. And you this has me. been defense has been yes. optional today. This is... 
too much. They left them too much time to win, and yeah. they did. Absolutely. What a game. That was a big victory. Because you even text me like, oh, it doesn't look good for your boys. Yep. But then I said, well, they left them too much time, and they did. Yeah. Well, then you got that big footed kicker, too. Yes, that's true. But, yes, so Coach Drink, keep it up. And if you ever want to join the show, we would be more than honored and blessed to have you or any one of your assistant coaches, players, join us for an interview. That absolutely would be okay with us. Yes, yes. But keep up. Keep fighting the good fight. Anything else about Mizzou? Uh, Until next week, we'll definitely talk yes, more. Yes, yes, we'll talk more. And I just, you know, Labor Day weekend can't get here soon enough. Oh, it is nigh, people. It is close. It will be here soon. I'm so giddy. I'm fired up. I can't help it. Iowa last year, overall, very, very solid season. Um, the Big Ten had a only conference schedule like the SEC, um, but they did play eight games, and they were going to have a plus one during they called a championship weekend. Iowa f overall record was 6-2. and two. That right there is good but how they finished the season winning six in a row i mean when you rail off six in a row you're playing good the first two games of the year a little bit rough the purdue opening loss purdue has just learned how to scheme against us and jeff brom who may or may not be on my list of coaches on the hot seat which we'll get to here shortly stay tuned he just has figured out iowa second game of the season up 17 nil uh, Northwestern, Northwestern comes back and wins 21-20. Now, Northwestern did win the West Division. So, kudos to Pat Fitzgerald. And who, what is Pat Fitzgerald? He's got a special ooh, place for you, right? I have to admit, people, because I come clean, Pat Fitzgerald is my number one man crush, I think, in the Big Ten. Keep doing what you're doing, but right behind him is Coach P.J. Fleck. He's rowing that boat to my heart. He's getting there. He's close. <laughs> but Pat Fitzgerald and the Northwestern Wildcats, congratulations. But after that game, Iowa seemed to kind of find it. They put they it did. together. Spencer Petras, that was his first year as a starter. Just like Connor Bazelak, there was some growing pains. There was. And you got to expect that from a young quarterback. Yes, absolutely. With no practice, no reps yeah. because of COVID once again. Um, the lasting memories for me, I think, first and foremost, was just seeing football. We all needed that escape from everything that COVID brought us. To see them on the field was an absolute godsend. But it was really nice that they finally broke the streak against a couple teams. Yeah. Penn State had, I have that down here, Penn State had won six straight against us. But in the early half of the century... Coach Ferentz, who's now entering his 23rd season, which is, wrap your head around that, 23 years as your head coach. Early in the, in the uh, century, Iowa kind of had their number. Yeah. Penn State had beat them six times. Last year, we went to Happy Valley, took care of business. So that was a good moment. But I think the last game of the year, when they beat Wisconsin. And Wisconsin had beat us four straight and wisconsin to me i have nothing but respect for their program barry alvarez the iowa connection when he was with hayden fry the legendary hayden fry mind you credit where credit is due that they just do it right and everyone knows that the west division it goes through madison you're gonna beat the, you're gonna win you've got to beat those guys yeah. it's kind of like right now with georgia with missouri to where you want to win the division you yeah. got to knock off the that is the team that you have to be. Absolutely. Yes, other things could happen. They could get a couple of losses here and there to where, hey, by default, we advance because we have a better record. That's totally okay. That takes nothing away. If Iowa was to win the division or if Mizzou is, but let's say don't be Georgia, don't be Wisconsin, I'm still going to take a division title. But if you beat those staples in our divisions, then you, you have that destiny in your own hands. Yep. At that point, you are that much closer. And Iowa last year defeating Wisconsin in the snow in Iowa City, excellent. That was my last. That was one of my favorite memories. It had to be of last you year. You know, uh, we discussed this, and what to me stands out about Iowa last year is we discussed and the the defensive numbers. It's impressive. The you know the de defensive numbers that they've done from a you know. I thank you, Charlie. That's nice that you bring that up. Thank you. I mean, it is the Big Ten, so I mean, oh. and, you know, it's not as you know. 
powerful as the SEC. Oh, but here we go. To have that type of a of a system and a defensive scheme to to hold people to that, and mm -hmm. I'll let you elaborate because it's your yep. it's your boys, your your stuff. So two, two, two. 22 straight games. 22 people. Almost two full seasons worth. The Iowa defense has not allowed 24 points or more. 22 straight games. Yes, are they playing world beaters on offense? Perhaps not. I mean, you but this is people like Nebraska you got to yeah. play who are horrible. But this is Division One football. It's true. To do that, and they, that includes bowl games. That includes Wisconsin, several matchups with them. Yes, they haven't played Ohio State in that span. They've played Penn State. I said Wisconsin multiple times. Uh, Purdue, who Jeff Brom is an offensive genius, but they've always come out on the losing streak of those. It and you know, like. and something I'm going to kind of butt in here a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to see when Iowa State Oof. and them meet up because what is what's – what Matt Campbell's doing at Iowa State oh, yeah. with that in-state rivalry. Yep. It's going to be interesting this year to see yep. if that number stays intact. Yep. It is really – it's something to me how overlooked the Iowa defense, how solid and just sound they are every year. To do that, that's also the Holiday Bowl against USC. And USC is still legitimate for wide receivers, running backs, oh, yeah. and to hold them. And they absolutely embarrassed the Trojans a couple yeah. of years ago in the Holiday Bowl. So Iowa has that streak going, but Charlie kind of brought it up. Next week, we'll expand more on this, but the opening two games for Iowa, I think, might be the hardest two games, I think, easily that Kirk Ferentz has ever coached. Yes. There are two opening yes. games against teams that are going to be probably both ranked in the top 15. With Indiana, then Iowa State, that streak is probably going to come to an end. We'll have to wait and see. Tune in next week, and I'll tell you what I think about the streak I th and how those first two games are going to go. And, you know, Indiana, I have to root for them. The underdog for oh, so yeah. long, so many the years. The doormat. To do what they've yeah. done, you know, I, props to them. And Coach Allen, what a great job he's doing there. Yes. He's still, like, he reminds me of, like, your high school gym coach. Yeah. He just kind of laid back. Yeah, just, it just, it's great. Yeah. I love what he's doing there, Coach Allen at IU. No longer a basketball school. We'll have to wait and see. But 6-2, and two, they did not play on Champions Weekend. Michigan had some COVID issues. Mm, I'm going to say yes, we have to believe it. They also did not play Ohio State. But Michigan season, I think they were perhaps ready to get it over with, which I think a lot of teams were yeah. with how it played out. Yeah. So more than likely, Iowa, uh, that was going to be hosted in Iowa City. It was going to be like a 5.30 kickoff cold as can be who wants to play that game they probably would have run off seven wins in a row being highly ranked they could have even been in their the running for maybe a potential new year six if it would have played out they ended up number 15 have. or 16 but it could have been seven in a row they were and the bowl games came out the invites we were so excited. Uh, we were pumped we up. We talked about it the whole... Oh. As soon as... When Big Ten started playing again, and then you guys started winning, you and I talked about yeah. it. Hey, you know, we're going to play each other. We could just feel it. Oh. We're like, this is going to be amazing. If it's somewhere close to where we live, we were oh, going to yeah. we go. Mm -hmm. You know, with mask up, whatever we got to do, yep. however it could be, we were going to go. Yep. And it just... And we said that for years. Yes. The next time that Iowa and Mizzou meet up in a bowl game, it's going to happen with the... The contractual agreements that the Big Ten and SEC have, it's going to happen at some point, gonna, sooner than later. I would love to see that a, a yearly rivalry. Yeah, you know, you so could not. have you could have like your your north rivalry with Iowa and your southern rivalry with Arkansas. Yeah. But that's the Arkansas is a would be your um, conference game though. So that's yeah. okay. It's but not it's, like but it's not still, that's a, that's yeah. their whole absolutely conference rivalry yes, that absolutely. they've got going. And if you could, you know, make Iowa your non conference rival. Mm-hmm. You know, because Mizzou had, with Kansas, the longest rivalry yeah. in college football, and then that ended, mm -hmm. which, I mean, we if we play them now, we get nothing out of it. It'd be yep. like playing a high school team. Yep. No offense to the KU fans, um, but as a Mizzou fan, yep. KU is just yep. it's like Nebraska. And we would see, let the best black and gold win. We know who that would be. But... They were picked to, they got um, invites to play in the Music City Bowl in Nashville. 
I have family that live in the great city of Nashville. They play in, I believe it's uh, Nissan Stadium, perhaps, I think it's called, where the Titans play. We were so excited, pumped up, but then it all kind of went to hell in a handbag. And let's it, rewind it here a little bit. And feel free. Okay. This is, I am not trying to obviously get under your skin no, or no, half no. of our viewers, because half of the viewers are here from Mizzou. That's that side of things. But, and Coach Drink is doing everything right. And this is something I should have said a little bit ago, but it's a good lead into where I'm going about the bowl matchup. Yeah. That throughout the year, he never got out coached, ever. He did. When you see the adjustments he makes, and you said that too, he never was a step behind. He never got out coached on the field. Sometimes better talent, more of it wins. And that's really the victory, their losses, excuse me, were all legitimate losses. Yeah. Except for the last game of the year, that was probably the only bad loss against the Bulldogs. Tennessee was, a, I'd say, I'd rack up Tennessee as a bad loss because Tennessee, you had a lot going on there. There were, you know, there were a lot of turmoil. They but were, lot didn't start that game. He came in the second half, right? So maybe if Connor starts the whole game, there's a different outcome. But this Tennessee, just, they, the whole game controlled line of scrimmage. And yes. We couldn't get nothing going. Yep. You know, when, you know, you got a quarterback running all over the place. And just picking up yard after yard after mm -hmm. yard, scoring touchdowns, and just they did what they wanted. Yep. And you know, and I think Drink, he's commented on that in the offseason that he has to control the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And I agree one hundred percent. He does that, we can easily get two of those wins back. Yeah. But when you look at it just on paper, if you say we have a Tennessee with Jeremy Pruitt, who had been coaching there for a while, Mizzou's coming into Knoxville, you know, hundred thousand of your closest friends, right? To where, okay. Tennessee should win that game. A new regime at Mizzou. So Tennessee winning that game, that's to me not a bad loss. It just isn't, to me. But the Bulldogs of Mississippi State, that was a, little that rough. Was a rough loss. That was a little rough. Maybe at that time, it was late in the season. Maybe, hey, let's just get this over with. Because these young men sacrifice so much across the nation. All of the tests. Stay away from your families. Mask up. Isolate. They... They all did everything that they were asked to. If not, there were repercussions. You'd have a little bit of outbreaks. Games were canceled. Some were made up. Some were not. So these young men last season did so much to put their teams first mm -hmm. to where you could see where the grind maybe what well, that was it. It had taken a toll on pretty much every team. But I do believe, in, and feel free, that... After the uh, Mississippi State game, there was some COVID issues with there was, Missouri. There was. And that was, I believe, like December, let me, I think it was December 19th. I think it was that weekend. I'm just pulling up my quick little handy dandy. But let's say it was late in December. And at that point, bad loss, you're five and five. And like I said earlier in the show, I am not claiming that Missouri was scared of Iowa. Ooh, I'm shaking, I'm shaking. No, absolutely not. Would Iowa probably have been favored because they were ranked? Probably. And they probably were playing better football. But it's decided on the field, as we both know. Yes. To where Iowa probably should have won against Mizzou, but we don't know that. I'm not going to make that assumption. There's no way of knowing, right? But uh, let's see, Missouri football, let's do past schedules. I just want to make sure I have my date right. Um, I think it was, let's see, here we go. Uh, yeah, December 19th. They, they leave Starkville with a loss. COVID issues. I don't think it was a major outbreak, but there were some positive there tests some. following. But this is why I, I said this earlier. It's not that I think Missouri was scared. Woo, but, like, they almost did what they could to sabotage that game. Because this is what Coach Drink did. Before, he, the right thing to do at that time, after everything these men had been through, is the best thing I can do for you is to give you a mental break. Go see your families for the Christmas holiday. Christmas is so special to basically everybody, but to me, I think even more. So I get why he did. That is the best thing to do. I wouldn't, and I agree, but I wouldn't say that he sabotaged the game because that's, to me, that's coming across as saying he didn't want to play, that he was just 
oh, you know, oh, we're, you know, we're not scared, but we're going to keep where we're at because we're at five and five. I don't think that was it. I think, you know, COVID was such a, a big deal, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I know Iowa made a big stink about it in the media, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to protect your players yeah. and, you know, we don't know yeah. what could have been, could have been an SEC thing. Yeah. And I can't, I can't fault Coach Drink for making that decision. I can't. Right. From a father's standpoint, as a brother, a son, that's what I would want to probably do too. I can't fault the personal side of that decision. Right. Absolutely. The, the humanity of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I also look the flip side that obviously Iowa wanted to play that game. And I'm not saying Mizzou didn't, but if they made that decision, like I know the Boston College coach, um, they made that decision, hey, we got a bowl invite, but we're not playing for the big prizes to where the best thing I can do is decline, send my boys home. Yeah. And if that's what Coach Drink, if he had that feeling of these men are exhausted, they are done, we're not going to accept. Then they would have found an opponent for Iowa to play. Like, I know Army was left out of yep. bowl selection. And then whoever was playing West Virginia bowed out because of COVID, and Army was replaced. So they definitely would have found an opponent for Iowa. But I look at it from the Iowa perspective, and I think them making a stink is kind of justified to where the players stayed on campus. They stayed in their bubbles. They didn't go home for Christmas. And yet, after Christmas, the decision was made, we're canceling due to COVID. I, no, I agree So there that, is definitely, it something. looks a little, and smells a little hairy. It just does. I wouldn't say that exactly. I think it could have been done differently. Yes. It could have been, you know, they could have said, hey, you know, with everything going on, we, we decline. Yep. You know, or maybe backed out sooner. So mm -hmm. you had a week and a half. You know, like we talked about at the start of this, the, this episode, BYU said, start driving east. Yep. We're going to find somebody. Yep. So Iowa had a chance to find somebody. Well, it, was, it all happened so quick because there's only a week and a half. If they left Stark on the 19th, and let's say he released his players on the 21st, when did he want them back to make the trip down to Nashville? The game was supposed to be the Music City the Bowl was on the 30th. So you don't – right there, it's kind of like from an analytics standpoint, you, how long do you let them stay for the holiday? You come back – then, hey, a day later, we go down to Nashville. It doesn't really line up. It seems like that was maybe prone to happen. It just wasn't going to happen. If you say, go home for, let's say, three or four days, five days, come back for a day, then we leave, and you don't really have any prep time. You don't have any walkthroughs. It just seemed, it seemed a little peculiar to me. That's all I'm going to say, and I'm sorry once again, I know some of you watching, listening, might be highly pissed off. I apologize, but I can handle. I'm a big boy, but just from my perspective, it does look. It did look pretty peculiar that it happened. It, like I said, and I, I think it could have been handled differently. Yes. But we don't know the true outcome we don't. of it. And what happened behind closed doors or behind you the know, curtain? Because we that's know. with college football. Like you know, Mizzou got rid of Sturk. Yep. You know, we got a new AD now, yep. so we don't know what it could have yep. been. It could have been administration. Made it could have been, decision. you know, yep. SEC commissioner. It yep. could have been we don't know. Missouri athletic director. Could have, who knows what it could have been? Yep. And Drink is, you know, obviously that's his employment. Mm -hmm. That's his boss, yep. and he's got to listen. So, yep. you know, could it be? We don't know. Yep. And, and we'll never know probably. And that's just one of those things. And it's just disappointing to me because I know that you said like Iowa should have won. I would have been ranked. We, yeah, we don't know. But yeah. I believe Missouri. Would have stopped that twenty-two game win. Well, I think they would have. I think, I think that one. Would I have think been we could have scored. I think we could have scored. We yep. might not have won the game, but we would have won the battle. Yeah, I think so. I did. They definitely would have given them a game, but we're never going to know. But at some point in the future, we are going to find this out. There's a chance it's we could going see. To happen. I think there's a chance that we'll a really good chance we could see each other this year. Absolutely. But overall, good things came from last season for both squads. We were happy with it as a fan, though. I mean, fan is short for fanatic. You always want more. But hindsight 2020, I think we're both happy with what happened last season. Oh, absolutely. More than happy. Absolutely. You know, and not just with, with our teams, but just, you know, other teams. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was so much that went on. You know, like something we haven't talked about was like the scandal going on at, at KU. Yeah. You know, less miles and all that, yeah. you know, and here you're paying a player, you're paying him to, to silence just so yeah. you don't come out with more stuff or the stuff at LSU that's yeah. came about. You know, it's, there's a lot going on. And also, too, I've got to—I got to say this, you know. Those of you who know me know I—I I, got to say it because I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. That 
another lasting memory of last season. Zach Wilson, excellent quarterback, great draft by the New York Jets, but Lisa, <laughs> Lisa Wilson, you will be missed. Don't forget about us. That's all I'm going to say about that. So I, she'll be missed too. Absolutely. But good luck to you and the Sun and the NFL. We'll definitely be watching. Um, next thing we're going to move on to, we'll kind of keep it going. Um, let's move into the quick, we'll do the coaching carousel. We had some, as there always is, major movement. But I didn't anticipate as much firings as what happened. You know, I really I didn't. didn't either, especially with, you know, COVID messing things up, not having, you Revenue know. Revenue and yes, everything. Yeah. And a chance to practice in that spring and get, get things kind of ironed out and then to say, okay, well, you, you know, you didn't get it done. Yeah. Well, it's kind of hard to get it done if you can't prepare. Yeah, especially within your conference and your division, really. I mean, it went rampant. I mean, it was like a clean and spring cleaning, basically. Yes. All right. Um, some ones I have here that are... We'll talk about the ones in the SEC and the Big Ten specifically, but we have Kevin Sumlin at Arizona was let go. Never really got traction there. No. Let go at A&M before that. Uh, we also have, you kind of brought it up, Les Miles at Kansas, where it's Kansas. It is a tough place to win. You are, the odds are forever not in your favor, you know, when you go to Kansas and be a coach. But Unless there was basketball. Yeah, basketball, yes. But there were some other issues that led to his dismissal, which we can maybe get at some other time. Yes. Um, Tom Herman was a surprise for me at Texas. I, I think that was a big surprise for me. Huge. Huge. Um, Gus, uh, the biggest one. Now, moving to the SEC. Gus Malzahn on Auburn. Not just one firing, but kind of two. You had Gus Malzahn and then Kevin Steele after him let go. Yeah. This was, to me, I think the biggest surprise of any of the firings that happened over the offseason. I think, hands down, because Gus Malzahn, has he ever won a title as a coach, as an offensive coordinator with Cam Newton? And they got close. They reached the national title game another time. But he has multiple victories against Nick Saban and Bama, to where I didn't really understand this move by Auburn. I just didn't. I don't know. I... You know, it's like I, I, I touched on it earlier. A great offensive mind, but he has not changed his offense much and adapted to, you know, it's just like anything else. You have an offense, defensive coordinators have a chance, game film, mm -hmm. abundance of game film to say, okay, we need to make changes. This is what's going on. Yep. And he never changed. So, yeah, he was getting it done against the bigger teams, but as a whole pitcher, the talent that he had, the offensive weapons he had, they had the, the the numbers as low as they were. Yeah, yeah. But I, it's, it's I big, was it's big business. I was so surprised by that. But we expect good things from him at UCF. He, they're going to keep yeah. it rolling down there in Orlando. But Will, Kevin still, you touch on him again. Yeah. How how wild that be to get hired by Tennessee? Yeah. For what was it? Wasn't it like six hundred thousand, four hundred thousand somewhere here? Nine hundred thousand. Nine hundred thousand for for basically a month. Yeah. That's great. Hey, hire, sign me up. Hire his agent. Sign me right? up. Absolutely. Sign me Where up. was my guidance counselor, you know? Where was he at or she at? But um, Will Muschamp, South Carolina out, not a big surprise, really struggled there. Yes. Jeremy Pruitt, Tennessee, a lot of off-field issues. Just You're like starting Les to hear Miles. more and more that there's – he had a lot of things going on yes. in that program that are going to start coming out. I wouldn't start – I would bet within reason with the next season or two, yeah. as more and more comes out, you yeah. might start seeing some yeah. some penalties. And we'll, def yeah, we'll definitely – Look at that more in depth in the future. There's no doubt about it. Um, and the other one, Derek Mason, did the best he could because Vandy is like Kansas. It is so hard to win at Vandy that they gave him time but just never worked out yeah. for Derek Mason and Vandy. Um, some new hires. Um, Arizona. You, you, for, you forgot one. Oh, yes, that's true. From Santa the Big Claus. Ten. Yes, Santa Claus. Lovey Smith. My boy, my boy Lovey. Yep. Lovey Smith out at Illinois and... We have a lot of Illinois ties. I grew up in Illinois, Northwest Illinois, hour and 15 from Iowa City. So most of my friends back home, diehard Illinois fans. But Lovey Smith, it was a little bit bittersweet. What yes. could have been there, but I think he just did not enjoy recruiting. He just didn't. No, and you know, and coming from the NFL, he had the right schemes, but he just, you can't recruit them there. No. I mean, it's, I mean, it's Champagne. Yeah. There's not a lot to do in Champaign. No. And as a, you know, you're 20-something years old, yeah. and, you know, you're in Champagne. What is there to do? Yeah. 
There's a lot to do in Champagne. We've been to Champagne. Yes, we have been. And yes. There's a lot to do, but not to the same level as ah, as you and I. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. All right, all right. Buy our book if you want more information, people. Yes. Um, new hires, we have Jed Fish at Arizona, which not a bad job. I think it's his first legitimate coaching job. Um, we have uh, Lance Leipold at Kansas. I like this hire. Lance Leipold at Buffalo was winning consistently, and maybe that's the best Kansas could get. But I think Lance Leipold, and it's, give him a chance. And you say it's the best they can get. Give him a chance. I think the dude, he, he could go to any Power 5 school, and I think he can get it done. Lance Leipold? Oh. I mean, think about what he's done. At Buffalo, yeah. Look, look at his resume. It's Buffalo. Yeah. But also before that, he won national titles at uh, Whitewater, Wisconsin. Yeah, that nice lower division. Now, now they're, they're smaller stuff. They're smaller schools. But coaching's coaching. Good coaching, coaching is good you know, coaching. It's, it's, if you can scheme well mm -hmm. and get your X and O's right, yep. and you can recruit, and if yep. you can sell Buffalo, you can sell Kansas. Yep. Hear him wax poetic, people. That is why he is here. So I, I like the Lance Leipold hire. I do. Um, Steve Sarkeesian at Texas. I, I'm not crazy. He basically, to me, is like Tom Herman 2.0. I mean, at when he was the head coach at Washington and USC, kind of marginal success. Just right above 500. And yes, he was at the helm of the vaunted Alabama offense last year, which might have been the best that we've ever seen. But you and I would have maybe good success calling X's well, and O's. We discussed this time and time again. You can be a great coordinator, yep. phenomenal coordinator, but you can be average at best yes. as a head coach. Yep. You can't put it all together and run the whole program yep. if you're focused on one thing. Yep. So, you know, I, I agree. Tom Herman yep. 2.0. Yeah, I think I, I think he'll he'll bring it up a little bit, but I think it's going to plateau quick. Yep. yep, absolutely. And I, I don't know. I'm going to the concerned. SEC? Yep, that might change some things too. I'm that's, a little that's concerned. Gonna that's I'm concerned help. about that hire, uh, UT fans, but we'll see how it plays out. Um, Brian Harson is the new head coach at Auburn. Comes from Boise State. I don't know much about him. I know he probably he appears to be a good coach. He has a good record, but can he thrive there in the South? He doesn't have a lot of ties to SEC country in the footprint. Time will tell. You know, in Mizzou, yeah. he was uh, in a talk before Drink got hired. He was. You know, people forget about yeah. that too. So I mean, nice. he's he's got some he's got some ability. Yeah. We'll see how that plays out. Shane Beamer's at South Carolina. Frank Beamer's son playing some Beamer ball there in uh, South not the Carolina. Same. He's, he's, yeah, it's not Frank. <laughs> we'll see. Josh Heupel at Tennessee. Somebody you have some familiar, and all you Mizzou fans. I tell you, out you know, there. when when he was the the offensive coordinator for us, he had one hell of an offense, but he had a quarterback that fit that scheme very mm -hmm. well. Yep. You had a strong arm quarterback that I, I Drew Locke, I, I think you're great, and I hope you have a lot of success, and I hope you beat out Terry Bridgewater and you are the starting quarterback. You're getting a lot of a lot of flack. Say uh, I heard recently on ESPN that you was that they compared him to Jay Cutler with less talent. Woo! That that one kinda hurts from, uh, from a zoo fan watching Drew Locke. That one kind of Ric Flair style. Woo! That does kind of hurt. That is that is that's, that's a, a low bad, that's a low, that's that is a low blow. very bad comparison. That is a direct hit battleship. It's sunk. That is yeah. woo. But yeah, we'll see how Josh Hypo can do there at Tennessee. Like I said, we'll, we definitely need to have an episode just on Tennessee. I we think. could. We, we really could. could. Um, Clark Lee comes to Vandy, the Notre Dame defensive coordinator. We'll see how it goes there. But here's my take. Defense coordinators don't make yep. the best head coaches. Now, my favorite hire, and maybe I'm not being a Big Ten homer, but I think you'll agree with me. Brett Bielema at Illinois, he spent some time in the NFL, but look at the success he's had in Big Ten country. Three Rose Bowls with Wisconsin. Yes. He has roots to the area. He knows how to win. I mean, the guy is a proven winner. And he knows how to, how to play in the Big Ten. Yes. I mean, his pedigree is... Ball control, solid defense, superb special teams, and that's really what the Wisconsin way is, which is kind of the Iowa way. And that's yeah. where Brett Bielema came from. When you are handpicked by Barry Alvarez to succeed him, the legend that Barry Alvarez was, I think this is an absolute – Just I can't even describe to you how happy I am. This is a great hire for Illinois. I think this is my best favorite hire of the offseason. I think without a doubt. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, but I just, you know, 
He's he's not Lovey. Yeah, I yeah. love my boy Lovey. He might be better. You're right. We'll see. <laughs> Time will tell. Once again, and the Fighting in Line are pegged to win only three games this year. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, okay, let's move on. We're kind of getting near the wrap-up time here. So let's move on to coaches on the hot seat. Let's go ahead. I'm going to give some coaches, and I want you to give me what your take is on it. Let's do how about is their seat simmering? Is it hmm, maybe it's boiling, or is it in fuego? All right? Okay. All right. And whose butt cheeks are really... <sighs> Puckering up a little bit more. Who's getting more nervous every week? Let's go ahead and start outside of the SEC and the Big Ten. How about Clay Helton at USC? You know, I don't. I he that one's that one. I think is just going to be it's warm because you know his numbers aren't the best, but he seems to get it done, and I think that's going to keep him. Okay, I tend to agree. I think if. They will give him at least one more season. They're showing some patience with him, but a lot of the fan base would like to maybe show him the door, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Right. How about Justin Fuente at Virginia Tech? You know, I think that's kind of the same level. It's warm. Um, they had some great games last, last year, but they also had some bad games last year. Mm -hmm. I think that um, he's got to get seven wins this year mm -hmm. to, make it, to make it relevant. Otherwise, I think he might be gone how about chip kelly at ucla you know another great guy offensive mind just cannot get traction at, at, i think he's pretty hot i think he's fleeing. i think i think he needs eight or nine wins this year and i don't see it happening i think he this is his last year the pac-12 south people might be the most competitive division this year coming. when you look at Hands four down. teams UCLA has a ton return. That's why this is make or break. I think it's absolutely in fuego for Chip Kelly. UCLA brings back a ton. So does USC. Arizona State, which has a little bit of turmoil themselves. We'll get to that here in a little bit. Brings back also a ton. And also, you've got Utah. I mean, this this is going to be a competitive division. I'm telling you. And that's I think it's in fuego. I think he has to win. He's, yeah, if he it's a it's winner go home. Uh, let's see, how about Herm Edwards at Arizona State? Now, I'm not saying this because of the perspective of wins and losses. Up until maybe a month or two ago, this name was not out there, being on all. the hot seat. Not at all. But there has been a ton of off-the-field issues, which is still going on. So we don't have all the information. But there is definitely a black cloud over Arizona State right now. So I think Herm Edwards... Is in fuego. And you what know you what think? bothers me about that is I love Herm Edwards. Yeah, he's too. a great guy. You know, when it comes to football, he's 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 historic. Yep. Um, but at the same time, you're the head coach. You you gotta you gotta run the show. And if you got assistants that aren't doing stuff by the book, yep, it's your it's it's you that's got to go. Yep. Cool. Unfortunately, and I I hate to say that, but I I would love to see him because what he's done out there is is an is positive. Yep. And I love what. James Tiberius Kirk said, the captain, I am the captain of a ship, so I am responsible for my shipmates and the people underneath me. Absolutely. So when these coaches claim, and there might be some factuality to it, that I didn't know this was happening with this coach or that coach or within the organization, the program, ultimately you're the one who is going to be front and center to answer for it because you are responsible for the conduct of the people underneath you. That's and it. You are. That is it. And it's, 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 that's, that's just life in yeah. general. You know. Um, how about Jim Harbaugh, who, now remember, he took a haircut. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Cut in half his salary at Michigan. What, and this is a tough one, what do you think about Jim Harbaugh? Well, for one, he, he, it's, he's a Michigan guy, so um, he doesn't rate very high. Slightly higher than Scott Frost because it's not it's not Nebraska. Oh, people. But at the same time, you look at He really at, is a great guy once you get to know him. Trust me. He is. Well here's I'm here's sorry. my thing. It's Jim Harbaugh. Mm -hmm. You look at what he has done up until the point he went to Michigan. Mm -hmm. And since then, teams that he has lost to, that he has, should have not lost to, mm -hmm. and the Big Ten, he's not getting it done. 
Absolutely. The recruitment team, the, the players he's getting, the five stars or four stars. And I know you can't always go by that. You can't say, oh, well, I've got more five stars than you. I'm going to win because there's a one or two star that's going to come out and just be you know, a first-round pick. Mm -hmm. But if you can't take the speed and put it on the field offensively and defensively and scheme to do what you got to do to win the games that you're, that you're paid to win, you got to go. I think he is – his butt's pretty hot. Okay. I will answer this question next week when we have our bold predictions. How about Scott Frost? Oh. And Nebraska. Nebraska? They are bad. Now bad. remember, this man has a history with you Nebraska Go Big Red fans. It's nothing personal, but the battles on the gridiron. I hate to bring it up. I've been I've been watching a ton of replays lately, the Big the, Ten the, the and the touchdown kick, kick, the kick the, game with Scott the, Frost. The the, the Ooh, five down, the fifth putting down. some salt in that wound yeah. a little bit there. Scott Frost, um, <laughs> He another guy, you know, oh, he's a great. true son. They hired him to win. He had a great offense. You know, you look at what he did at UCF. Um, I I just don't see mm -hmm. him sticking around because what he's got this year, he has got to make a push. And if he does not, he is he's gone. Got you. I mean, you look at what he's got returning. Mm -hmm. Oh, he should be. And they have not really much. The thing is, they have they have been absolutely poached with transfers. That and that's, that's, his, that's his thing. Why is everybody transferring? I mean, Adrian Martinez is back for his last year, his hand-picked quarterback. But, yeah, they just can't – they can't keep players there to develop. It just seems like there's – there might be something going on behind the curtain. Don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain and once they said in Oz. That's could that's what, maybe what's going on. We don't right. know. I think there's got to be something because you don't have a head coach running – a good program and have that many people leave. Yep. How about Jeff Brom? And this is one that a lot of people maybe aren't mentioning, but I go back to look what's happened at Indiana, the turnaround. Coach Allen is getting paid significantly less than Jeff Brom. Because remember, after the first year, Jeff Brom was going to head back to Louisville. Yeah. Purdue paid him more. And there really hasn't been any success. They have good wins. I mean, they absolutely shocked the world and beat Ohio State with Urban Meyer when Rondale Moore just run he ran rampant over them. <clears throat> but it really hasn't materialized there in West Lafayette. And you know, I, I think it's it's gonna be kind of warm and it can be hot hot because, you know, great coach. Mm -hmm. But I think he's a better offensive coordinator than he is a head coach. I remember a couple of you go back several years ago when they played Mizzou. Now Mizzou didn't put up the best numbers on defense yeah. but they did what they wanted to do offensively to us and their defense stepped up and shut us down when he has the players that can run his system it's scary dangerous what could happen there but there he's sub 500 you know overall record at purdue but every conference has got that he's got that, the iowa defense figured out i'll tell you that and he does but the thing that you got to look at is every conference has one to two teams that are the bottom mm -hmm. you know Vandy and the SEC. I, I hate saying it. I like Vandy. Their baseball team was phenomenal. Oh, uh, but, you know, you just Kansas. There's just certain schools in each division, each conference, that just can't get it done. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, they're the teams that maybe shouldn't be there. I mean, if I got recruited, if I had a chance to go to any Big Ten school and Vandy offered me, or uh, not Vandy, Purdue offered me a scholarship, I wouldn't go. Nope. Yep. Unless you knew you were going to see maybe the field right away. Oh, if, if I was going to be the coaching staff and what their message was, if you bought in, maybe. But if you go Purdue, Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin, maybe in Iowa. Now, yeah. you know, if, if Gary Barnett flew me, if he's head coach and flew me in, in a private jet, that might be a little bit different. Oh. Like back in the day? Oh, yeah. Yeah, back in the day. Or if, you know, Fitzy showed up at my house, I'd be in Northwestern. I'd say, let's go. You know, let's, but, let's go do this. What if it was PJ and Fitz? Oh, boy. I think my heart would just skip the beat. Thinking about that, just wow. envisioning that made wow. my heart just. <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, um, how about this one? This is one that I'm adding right now to my list because, granted, this is going to be a shocker to you. And I don't necessarily think it's because of what's happened on the field. I'm thinking off the field issues that are happening, but most have not been under his watch. I will say that. Two years removed from a national title, and you know the LSU fan base is as wild as they get. They're so passionate. But how about Coach Ed Ogeron? I mean, last year, 5-5, five and five, 
And there is a lot of stuff going on down in Baton Rouge there off is. the field. There but is. most of it was more on Les Miles that's coming out anyway that has been either confirmed or still in the process. But you've got to root for Coach O. I love this guy. When you when you hear him talk, I mean, just he's your favorite. He's definitely Farmer Fran from The Water Boy and from Joe Dirt. I mean, he's so down to earth. The 60 Minutes interview he gave, he's so family-oriented, humble. It's hard to root against this guy, but he's just the best. It's hard for me to think that he could be on the chopping block. I mean... Just just watch the sound bite. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Is that any different from home where you make it? No, no, no. Home where you make it. I mean, that's Coach O. That's great. What do you think? I, I agree. You know, I think he's a great dude. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, he had that video that, that was kind of went viral where he was running. Yes. Around shirtless. campus shirtless. He's like 60 something. Like, was he like The guy's 60? built like a tank. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I always thought he was, he was kind of just a bigger guy, but he had... He had some definition. He's got that man. solid beer gut. That's like, wow, is that a beer gut or is that solid just abs? You can't tell him. You guy. know, seeing that as as a younger guy he being younger than him, I would not want to see him in a dark alley. I think I might come out pretty beat up. I mean, he's he looks like a big dude to me. I am a big dude. I I jiggle and I wiggle when I walk. I don't have this like some of us do. I wasn't blessed with that. Oh, come on, man. But yeah, Ed Ogeron, I think. There's trouble down there with him. If they there underperform, but is. they have a ton returning. After last year's exodus before the season, all those cats got playing time. I expect a good season from LSU this year. I think I think they're gonna write the ship and they'll they'll be they'll be good. I don't think he's very hot right now. No, no, no. Everybody know that boy. Damn boy. Home where you make it. Oh, I gotta love Joe Dirt. Actually, it's Deer Tay. It's Deer Tay's French. French. Well, folks, we had a little bit more of that. Man, I feel so good. I am still so pumped up. I mean, the blood is just you know, I, flowing yes. through me. And there's so much about college football. I feel like running a marathon here. We've been on here an hour and 20 it's minutes. It's been an hour and 20 minutes. We definitely had a little bit more that we wanted to get around to, but we can put it on next week's show. But... And once again, we don't have any permissions or copyrights. We can't do sound bites from music or from movies. But right now, the way that I feel, I mean, picking a song and waxing poetic or some lyrics, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe Rod Stewart. I mean, if you like my body and you think I'm sexy, come on, sugar, tell me so. I mean, I feel like that. I feel good. Wow. I just feel great. Wow. Now, is it, is he Sir Rod Stewart? Has he been knighted? Uh, I'm not for sure. Because a lot of the, the blokes, say he might, for you sir. English folks, the blokes who are kind of like in his, you know, uh, age range that have been performing, like Sir Elton John, Sir Paul McCartney. Is there Sir well, Rod you, Stewart? Yeah. Uh, who is the, the uh, oh, the actor, the old actor. Um, oh, my gosh. I can't think of his name. I'm, I'm bad on that. Right now, I can't. I fucking picture his face. But there's so many people, celebrities, musicians, or actors. After it seems like 20, 30 years, if you if you're relevant, you become sir. Let's go ahead and see real quick. I, I'm I'm gonna venture to guess that he is. He's been nice. Sir Elton. Sir. So I'm I'm sure if Elton John is, I'm sure Rod Stewart. Stewart. Let's see, and drum roll. Yep, there he is getting knighted. So, Sir Rod, Sir Stewart. Rod Stewart, I'm sorry for my initial disrespectful comment. So go hang out with Sir Elton, Sir Paul, and Sir Mix-a-Lot. There we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, um, a little uh, what's on tap for next week. Once again, we are weekly. We'll try to be on next Wednesday or Thursday. Once again, smash that subscribe button, people. Yes, Get please. those notifications. Please, we encourage your involvement, your family to us. We are doing this just as much for you as we are for ourselves. Let us know how we're doing. We will get better at it. But for next week, good stuff. I'm even more pumped up for next week. We'll go ahead and talk about the major storylines and headlines that have started to shift the landscape with the transfer portal, oh, yes. name, image, and likeness, expansion, realignment, all of this that's breaking. I mean... All of this that's happening to the sport we love. I mean, it's good, it's bad, it's ugly. Wah, 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 wah. But I feel like Bruce Wayne. I feel like I just got out of a movie and I'm walking down the street with my parents enjoying my popcorn and 
boom, what happened? I feel like my head's spinning. Like, there's the been Exorcist. A lot, there's been a lot going on. There has been a lot going on. Here comes on, the pea soup from The Exorcist. That's what I feel like. The pea soup. Ugh. I know. Bad image. So we'll definitely do storylines and headlines. And we actually plan on doing that every week, but we're a little long-winded this week. Our apologies, but we're just so excited. Um, also, we're going to go ahead and do our bold predictions, which I think that's going to be one of our favorite episodes, I think. I think I'm going to love doing what I anticipate or think or want to have happen with this season, my bold predictions. Charlie's going to join me on those. We're also going to go ahead and kind of look more specifically at Mizzou and Iowa. We'll start to break down our brands a little bit more in depth. We're going to go through the schedules for both squads, give you what we project their record is going to be, and then we also will give you the ceiling and the floor where they could end up. And also, I do believe the first AP poll comes out next week. The coaches poll came out earlier this week on Monday. But so we're going to give you our reactions to the initial AP rankings, who's overrated, who's underrated, who should be rated, and we'll go from there. And then we're going to have the usual, here we go, top five, never changes. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, to kind of quote the, the great former coach Rick Neuheisel when he says about the playoff, and I love this, that we've all seen this movie before. But yet we still buy a ticket knowing it's going to be one of six or seven teams of the four. At least three of those six or seven are going to make it, and the fourth is a wild card replaced by one, two, or three. But we still buy a ticket because we love it. That's it. Because we absolutely are still so enthralled and passioned with this sport. We have to pay attention. But maybe the expansion of the playoff, which we'll talk about next week, is going to cure some of that. Those, eight, those I think it's uh, going to help. Ills. I think absolutely. it will help. I think it will help. Um, as far as final thoughts for me, thank you once again, everyone, for being with us. This has been most an excellent adventure. <laughs> some Wild Stallions uh, style, some Bill and Ted. I just want to say, give a shout out, a thank you to my wife for, you know, backing me on this. I love you. My children, Eliana, Connor, love you terribly. And I'll talk to you next week. Charlie, anything you want to say, your departing thoughts? I just want to say thank you to everybody for watching us and uh, giving us your time. Um, we love this sport. We love this game. Um, I just can't get enough of it. Um, my kids are starting to fall into place. Uh, my wife thinks I'm a little crazy about it. She kind of quite understand it, but she's not, never, she's not a sports fan. So I, I forgive her for that, you know. But she's great. She's a great She's woman. She is. She's great. She is. You know, she is great. I can't thank her enough for letting me have my Saturdays to watch football mm -hmm. and to get away and, you know, my kids for putting I, up with I it. I know it's tough to part ways with this good-looking face. I get it. But thank you because he also then spends some time with me, and I love that. I'm a better man for it. I'm so excited that we're doing this together. I don't have somebody else sitting in this seat. This is great. I mean, this is like my brother right here, and this is excellent. But... For, so next week, thanks for tuning in to the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog. And I will leave you with this, Cool Runnings. Do you remember what it means? I do not. Peace be the journey. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Take care. God bless.